Gare tonda je je kuma no mentene be janda to da tumba no ye kuzo zo ta ye de jo tandara de le yo so je be je jo je me to tamma ro ro le je ni de je mo de so je je do me de mo ye do ku na da ki la wa je mo yo inda ango ro re no me do Nia Dagi let us cultivate the altruistic motivation seeking complete enlightenment for the sake of liberating infinite, kind, mother sentient beings. With that kind of uh, bodhicitta motivation, that we should all participate in this teaching. I believe that uh, all of us are seeking complete enlightenment as our ultimate uh, spiritual goal. So in order to become complete enlightened uh, beings or Buddhas, uh, it is uh, essential for us to cultivate uh, great compassion or Mahakaruna in our own uh, mind stream. And I know that you have, um, you know, heard uh, uh, the term, uh, you know, compassion a lot uh, in Buddhist teachings, but I think it's important for us uh, to be able to uh, differentiate between different types of compassion, if you will. Uh, we may talk about uh, just a mere compassion, or we can talk about what is called Mahakaruna or Great Compassion, but they are not one and the same kind of compassion. No, no. Now, when we talk about, uh, you know, the language we use is in Sambhava, a mere compassion or just compassion. Now, that is something uh, which is common to all different uh, yanas or vehicles of uh, Buddhism, hearers or Shravaka yan, solitary realizers or Pratyaka Buddha yan, and uh, Bodhisattva Yang or Bodhisattva's vehicle. So we do find compassion in all of these uh, different forms of Buddhism or different vehicles of uh, uh, Buddhism. And as we know that we have many different, uh, uh, you know, religions or uh, spiritual traditions in our world, and uh, I think almost every spiritual tradition or religion talks of compassion. So there is a compassion 
that is recognized by, if you will, one and all, and uh, that is found in different uh, religious traditional systems and also within different uh, schools of thought or vehicles uh, within uh, Buddhism. So it is not enough for us uh, just to give a lip service to compassion. You know, it's not enough just to be able to recite compassion or say it very nicely. You know, sounds good when we say it uh, verbally. Uh, to be able to understand and cultivate compassion, we have to, uh, you know, educate ourselves, uh, uh, if you will, in the matters of compassion. In other words, we have to understand uh, uh, what is uh, uh, what we call the focus of compassion, mikpa, or the object of compassion, and what is its subjective aspect. What are we really focusing on when we cultivate compassion? What is compassion when we feel it? So there's the subjective aspect of compassion, and there's the objective aspect of compassion, if you will. So we have to understand all those dimensions of uh, compassion. Mm -hmm. Now, when we differentiate between uh, you know, compassion, that is understood, as I said, in all religious traditions or also within different schools of Buddhism, and great compassion, uh, so the difference or the distinction is primarily understood in terms of uh, the focus of compassion. When we talk about great compassion, its focus is very vast and extensive, you know, compared to uh, just a mere uh, compassion. No, no. Now, when we talk about great compassion or Mahakaruna, its uh, focus or object uh, is, as a matter of fact, every sentient being. So that's why we talk about all sentient beings. Great compassion is extended equally towards all sentient beings with unbiased attitude. And unbiased in the sense we cannot in our mind think that, you know what, yeah, I like this group of people or beings, so I'm going to have compassion for them, but these are the ones, I mean, who cares? No, then there's a problem. We already got bias, you know, in our way of thinking. So great compassion is extended equally towards all sentient beings, literally all, right? That means every sentient being is a part of this great uh, compassion. And its subjective aspect is that we truly wish, you know, we are not just faking it out, or we are just not putting on a show, or, or a facade of something, but we really truly feel inside how nice it would be if all these beings are free from suffering and its causes. So when you talk about, uh, you know, you might use the word ordinary compassion or mere compassion, as I'm trying to translate it very literally here. So this is a very limited type of compassion. In other words, that we may generate compassion in relation to a particular sentient being or a group of sentient beings. Anyway, the limited number of sentient beings. You know, we really wish them to be free from suffering. Now, that kind of a compassion, it is a compassion, no doubt, but it is what we call near compassion. It is a very ordinary compassion. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, within great compassion, we can talk about, uh, you know, if we look within, are there different types within this great compassion, so-called? Yes, there are three, you know, uh, types of uh, great compassion. Now, 
یعنی یہ کہاں گے اچھا بات ماشی بچن تیسے گھر ماتے ہیں سنجی سیرہ پال سکی گا ہمارے So there is a compassion, although like, you know, the, in the Tibetan technical term, it sounds like exactly the same, like a mere compassion, same and some, but the meaning is different. The meaning here is the word mere, it is to be understood as this is the compassion which is simply focused on. The mere has the sense of simply focused on uh, all sentient beings. That, I need, you know, Sengji matapala mingmiyane yang hiyishimu chiyoris. Sengji matapala mingmiyane hiyishimu chiyoris. So in other words, when we say that there is a great compassion which is merely focused on sentient beings, the word merely in this case should be understood as sentient beings are not seen or perceived as being characterized by certain attributes or qualities. Okay, they are just sentient beings and we are not talking about any other characteristic of sentient beings. So that's uh, one great compassion. Uh, so now another, sorry, excuse yeah. me, the great compassion is compassion, we say, is focused on impermanence of sentient beings. Now in this case, this compassion, you see, it is uh, not only focused on all sentient beings, but perceives sentient beings as being characterized by impermanence. Uh, so in this case, you know, within this great compassion, we also take into account, uh, you know, transitoriness of sentient beings or the impermanence of sentient beings. Oh, no. Now, the third kind of great compassion is, yes, it is focused on all sentient beings, which is, you know, same with any great compassion. But in this case, this compassion it takes into account that sentient beings are characterized by selflessness. They are empty of inherent existence, you know. So this great compassion focuses on the sentient beings, but also considers or takes into account that sentient beings are without self. They are empty of inherent existence. Tali here with the Mandos in the Ali Chapter Hubina. A Tambutan letter, and they say, Niji Telani, Niji Chambos and Nikita, Niji, Tambos, and Nin to wash on so much. So let me kind of run through the list what I've said. You know, first I try to differentiate between what is called a mere compassion and great compassion, or ordinary compassion. You might use that language if that's, you know, it's your preference, and great compassion. That thing you chapter the young condition, not big one in my job is saying any, me big one, me was sent you Tangi Limipata, sent you Tangi Sent Shadrapa Limipigonta, some chicken, some of the chapter in Chavatuzi Gasmos. So the difference we made between or how we, you know, differentiated uh, mere compassion from great compassion is not in terms of subjective aspect because both wish, you know, others to be free from suffering. But in the case of mere compassion, it is focused on a particular sentient being or a certain limited number of sentient beings. Whereas the great compassion, it is focused on all sentient beings. And then I said that great compassion can also be uh, presented uh, you know, uh, at three different levels, if you will. There is what we call great compassion, which simply focuses on sentient beings without being characterized by this and that. It's just sentient beings. Okay? And then there is the great compassion focusing on sentient beings you know, uh, and perceiving them as being characterized by impermanence. Right? And then there's the great compassion focusing on all sentient beings, you know, seeing them as being characterized by selflessness or emptiness, emptiness of inherent existence. So the you know the subjective aspects of compassion, the objective focus of the compassion. And, uh, you know, compassion characterized by impermanence or characterized by selflessness, all of these things have been 
uh, how should I say, presented originally by Shakyamuni Buddha himself in, uh, in sutras. So the original ideas came from Shakyamuni Buddha, or the original teachings on the, you know, compassion came from Shakyamuni Buddha. Then later, a uh, great uh, pioneer, uh, you know, commentators or elucidators of Buddha's teaching, uh, there are two uh, who have been uh, prophesied by Buddha himself, Arya Nagarjuna and Arya Asanga. You know, they elucidated, uh, you know, Buddha's teachings, if you will, uh, of different aspects of the teachings in more detail. You know. <laughs> Uh, and then what has been uh, elucidated uh, by Arya Nagarjuna and Arya Asanga, these are the great Indian uh, Buddhist masters, uh, uh, has further been kind of elucidated or clarified by uh, a, a lineage of uh, great Indian uh, you know, commentators or oh. masters. <laughs> So I just uh, kind of highlighted, if you will, uh, the three types of great compassion. And uh, great Indian master uh, Acharya Chantakriti, in his uh, uh, supplement to the middle way of Madhimik Avatar, uh, among states, Kesala quoted the whole uh, you know, stanza from his memory, where Chantakriti talks about, he says, first there arises uh, the conception of I or self. And then arises the conception of mind. And so because of these two graspings of the conceptions, uh, that uh, you know, sentient beings uh, wander in different states of samsara or single existence, you know, uh, without control over their own life, in helplessly. And the metaphor and example given is, which is kind of a little, you know, seems like it should be easy to present, but it is not really. Uh, and uh, in this, so it's, it's, that it's just like the bucket you know, we send through the well to pull out the water. So once you send it down, that bucket really hits anywhere inside the wall or whatever the bucket does inside. There's not much control over that. Just, just like that, we are so caught up in some sort of cyclic existence, basically uh, due to the two types of uh, conception or the grasping. Yes. So that Chantakit is the, that you know whole stanza. It, it really uh, you know deals with what is called uh, great compassion, simply focusing on sentient beings. So how do we cultivate it? Of course, uh, 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 what is indispensable to cultivate great compassion is that we have to uh, understand and focus on the suffering of sentient beings. We have to understand you know, other suffering. We have to uh, deal with suffering, if you will. Uh, so when we say that we really have to understand uh, the suffering of sentient beings in order to feel compassion for them, of course, no, you know, we cannot sort of, uh, how should I say, uh, think of a suffering more like a construct or an abstract idea there. Yeah, suffering, some kind. Well, that's really not going to cut it, as you might say. What we really need to do is uh, we have to have a sort of grounded understanding of a suffering. And in the Buddhist literatures, um, of course, there's elaborate presentation of suffering. And basically, we talk about uh, three types or categories of suffering. There is what we call suffering of suffering or suffering of misery. Well, probably those are the two best translations you can hear. But, 
And then there is uh, the suffering of change. And then there is what are called the pervasive suffering or extensive suffering. And just all sentient beings, all of us, uh, you know, experience these different types of uh, suffering. So according to Buddhist explanations of the presentations that we as sentient beings in samsara or secular existence, you know, we uh, you know, experience one or another form of suffering which all belongs to the three types of suffering, you know, continuously or, you know, I mean, uh, constantly, if you will. Now you could ask, why is that? You know, how come, you know, we bump into one or another kind of suffering? You know, you know how is that happening? The Buddhist literature, excuse me, explained that because as long as we are under the influence and control of deluded states of mind, glaciers, you know, nyanmo, and contaminated karmic actions, so long as we are under their domain or the control, you know, influence, then the result is suffering. Because of being under the influence or control of uh, diluted states of mind or negative uh, afflictions and contaminated karma or karmic actions, that uh, we experience uh, the three types of suffering in samsara. Okay. Now we could ask the question, so how come we are under the influence of delusions and contaminated karmic actions? You know, where does it all begin, so to speak, right? As the Chantakriti tells us, it is basically because first there arises the conception of I or the self. There's a grasping at I, right? So I becomes the center of the universe, if you will. You know, everything has to do with I, you know, I, whatever. And then, you know, that's not in it. There's more to that. Then there's the conception of mind, as Geshe was saying, you know, my body, my eyes, my ear, my house, my car, my telephone, whatever. Now you add to the list all the mice. So, because of these two conceptions, conceptions of I and conception of mind, so we, you know, uh, we come under the influence of delusions and create contaminated uh, uh, comic actions. And our situation seems like as if we really are helpless in some sense, you know, and the way we um, got caught up in samsara. And the metaphor, the example that's being used in early, I just made it easy, said a bucket, but really it is not a bucket. Uh, but uh, this is always I found it out, you know, sometimes the meaning should be more difficult to present, and I, in this case the example is difficult to present. Maybe some of you who went to India, you have seen this or some other countries, they, in India, you see, in order to you know, irrigate the you know, field, this is an old-fashioned irrigation yeah, system. Yeah. There is the well, and on top of that, they have built this whole kind of ferris wheel kind of thing, and there are so many water pots attached to it. And then they, you know, either a human being will rotate this wheel, or there is going to be ox or a cow or whatever, donkey, you know, just uh, rotating this. So one, what's happened is, this wheel started to rotate, and it pulls the water. But there is no beginning or end to this, you know, turning of the wheel. 
you know. And once you rotate the wheel, the wheel just goes on. It's like helpless, you know, uncontrollable. And so we are, in a sense, like that, that being under the influence of uh, delusions and contaminated karmic actions, that even though none of us wants to be in samsara, you know, but we are in samsara. See, so we're just kind of helpless. We don't want to be here in samsara, but we are in samsara. See. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Now, I would like to clarify what I do mean by when the Chantakita says, first there arises the conception of I, or grasping at I or self, and then the grasping at mind or conception of mind. Of course, in a conventional sense, there is I. So it seems very legitimate, you know, to say that, you know, to feel this is who I am, I. You know, there is that sense of I which exists conventionally. You know, we're not denying that. But in this case, when we say there arises the conception of I, what we're really saying is, that uh, the way we uh, see I or the self to exist and grasp at it, those of us ordinary uh, people, ordinary in the sense that we have not yet uh, realized emptiness non-conceptually. We haven't realized emptiness directly yet. Okay? So the way we experience that conception of I or the self is as if the I has that inherent entity, that fixed notion of I, you know, and that's where the problem is. Not so much there's the conventional sense of I or self. Well, that is there, you know. But, you know, we have a different uh, conception of I or self, which basically perceives the self to exist in a way it does not exist, inherently in and of itself. Now, those who have directly realized emptiness as it is, non-conceptually, at least just see emptiness, you know, as we say, uh, on the palm of their hand. So these... Uh, uh, you know, people, if you can call them, you know, the way they experience I is very different. You know, there is that conventional sense of I, but they do not perceive the I or the self to exist inherently in and of itself. Yes. Yes. So what I'm really trying to get across to you is, you know, when we say that is, you know, that uh, conception of I, I do not want you to get the wrong notion that, okay, now I don't exist at all, okay? Well, there is conventional I or the self, because it is the basis for uh, the accumulation of actions, karmas, and experience of the karmic results, because there has to be I or the self, you know, who is the doer of actions and who experiences, experiencer of the outcome of the karmic actions. So that is there. But there is another sense of I or self that we have, which is really a flawed, you know, way of thinking. I does not exist, you know, in and of itself objectively, in a such a fixed notion, you know, but that's how we see it. So, what Chantagiri is saying is first there arises the conception of I or grasping at what he's saying is that we ordinary beings. You know, we perceive I or the self, that is our self, as inherently existent. Not only that we do perceive the I to exist in that way, now we grasp at that I. You know, that's me, you know. And so from that conception of I arises the concept, which is basically what we call grasping at the self of a person. Okay. Now from that conception arises the conception of mind. Now we see everything we call mind as inherently existent. Now that is called grasping at the self of phenomena. See, we talk about true t- grasping at two types of self. Grasping at the self of a person and grasping at the self of phenomena. That's why I said that 
So we really need to kind of understand uh, that uh, that grasping at the self of a person, that is grasping at our own self, that is the root cause of our being in samsara. Mm. So when we um, uh, kind of um, look at the big uh, in a picture here, so what we're saying is okay, uh, that I, you know, experience all kinds of suffering in samsara because of my contaminated karmic actions and delusions because I'm under their influence, and from where do the uh, um, the delusions arise is basically from our grasping at the self of a person. Okay? So that's how I'm stuck in samsara. Now I look at other sentient beings, it's the same story. You know, others are stuck in samsara because of the same problem they got it, that I do. Okay? And so that's how we try to understand uh, the situation, the predicament uh, uh, you know, within which we find ourselves in. Uh, and so based upon such kind of a theory and understanding that we all sentient beings are caught up in samsara, we constantly experience one or the other form of suffering, you know, all kinds of suffering we experience uh, uh, fall within the three types of suffering that I mentioned earlier. And so we uh, now generate the, these thoughts and the feelings, how nice it would be if sentient beings are free from all kinds of suffering. May they be free from suffering. Okay, so that's how we cultivate, uh, uh, you know, compassion uh, for sentient beings. Oh, and so in the Buddhist literature, sometimes we come across uh, the terms uh, such as uh, four immeasurables, immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, and in which case uh, uh, and then, you know, it's explained in many different ways, like when we uh, generate the feeling how nice it would be if, sent, if the beings are free from suffering, that is more like an aspiration, right? We have, so that's uh, what we call the dubaseme, you know, it's just like immeasurable as, aspiration. Tower <laughs> So in our meditation, or as we cultivate, uh, you know, either it is a love or a compassion or great love or great compassion, whatever the case may be, uh, you know, we can uh, generate these uh, uh, different levels, if you will, all of which are connected to compassion or love, but let's just work with one of them so that it's less confusing. In this case, we're talking about compassion. So when we generate the feeling how nice it would be, genuinely, not faking up, you know, that has to be the key that we genuinely feel how nice it would be if beings are, sentient beings are free from suffering. Okay? And then we go to the high, other high, if you could say, another level says, 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 may sentient beings be free from suffering. And then we say that, may I be able to do that? You see, now that is related to our, our the, what we call the sense of responsibility. I said, that, may I be able to shoulder the responsibility of uh, freeing sentient beings from suffering? Yes. 
And then um, we say there are a series of thoughts we generalize how nice it would be if sentient beings are free from suffering. May they be free from suffering. May I be able to help sentient beings free from suffering. All gurus and Buddhas bless me to be able to do that. You see, so I mean, that's how we, uh, we cultivate in great compassion, which applies to other attitudes as well. You know. <laughs> So that's uh, just a very brief explanation about how to cultivate uh, what is called great compassion, simply focusing on sentient beings. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, great compassion characterized by impermanence or the perception of impermanence. And in the Buddhist literature, as Geshe was quoting the uh, relevant uh, lines from his memory, so he says that, now when we try to understand how sentient beings are transient or impermanent, then we use different examples, one of which is just like the reflection of a moon on the surface of the water. That reflection is very ephemeral, you know, it is you know, moving, it's not fixed on the water, you know. So just like that reflection, of a moon on the surface of the water, which is very impermanent, transient. So like that, all sentient beings are transient or impermanent. So an essential part of uh, cultivating great compassion characterized by impermanence is that we really have to understand uh, what is called uh, a momentary uh, changes or disintegration, how everything disintegrates or changes from moment to moment. Nothing remains fixed, you know, for a moment, okay? And uh, so, when we think of sentient beings, how every sentient being undergoes momentary changes or disintegration, then we are really focusing on the transitory nest of sentient beings. Now, when we think of uh, any phenomenon that is impermanent, think of it like a series of moments. When the first moment arises, Right, it arises. And then when the next moment arises, the first moment ceases to exist. It's just the next moment. It's not the same. The second moment has arisen. The second moment ceases to exist and the third moment arises. So everything is changing from moment to moment. You know, that's what we call impermanence, understanding. And as I said earlier, uh, what's related to this is how we as sentient beings uh, are uh, you know, under the influence of uh, delusions and uh, comic actions. And because of this, we are also, you see, not fixed anywhere. You see, we go through all kinds of uh, uh, experiences. Mm-hmm. So in other words, that, you know, because of our grasping at permanence of life and things, you know, because of that sense of permanence, that we have a grand plan to live forever, you know, so then has to be a part of that great big scheme, you know, we have to have hundreds of plans, you know, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and that, and this, and so there's no end to it, because basically that whole thing is grounded in that sense of permanence, right? As if I'm going to live forever, okay? In our state of mind, you know, maybe theoretically we understand we'll die one day, but that is the abstract and uh, the intellectual part, as Geshe would say. But inside, the way we really think who I am and how I'm going to live is as if forever. So if I'm going to live forever, then my whole plan is I got to, you know, do everything because I'm going to live ever, forever. Uh, so because of that, 
Now we come under the influence of delusions. We create all kinds of contaminant karmic actions, and then the whole, you know, snowballing thing happens. You know, one kicks into the other, and there's no end to our story. So when we look at ourselves, how this is how we are, and how sense, other sentient beings are in the same situation, right? So then we generate this great compassion to sentient beings, to and for sentient beings, understanding that we are all impermanent. So when we really look at strictly what uh, you know, the real practitioners, if you will, have to do is, the expression is, it says, which means uh, give up this life. Of course, this does not mean that commit suicide, you know. Okay. Uh, but what really it means is we should give up all the worldly concerns and attitudes, you know, all these headaches about living in the world. But the fact of the matter is, you see, we, ha we are not doing that. We are not giving up the worldly concerns and attitudes. Why? Because one of the reasons is grasping at permanence of life. You know, we have a whole plan inside us. And so because of that plan, we don't renounce the worldly attitudes. We don't, you know, abandon the worldly uh, concerns. Those who are truly into spirituality uh, or dharma is of this and future lives, they are bent upon in fulfilling the betterment of future lives. And this life is relatively speaking, when we think in terms of future lives, insignificant, you know, not so important, you know, but what's more important is the future life. And true practitioners of uh, spirituality or dharma and worldly activities, they would consider the dharma or spiritual, spirituality as more important and they will try to do as less as and renounce worldly activities. I think Raja Ta Kachi Lok Do Pas, Kachi Ta Ta Lok But all of us, when we really self, do the self-examination, our story is just the opposite. We're just doing, you know, just the opposite of this, uh, this principle. Say Shema Dei Ba Yuk, and then Chen Dei Kei Chai Vashin Ta, Chen Dei Tan Ta Pei Chai Vashin Ta, <laughs> so we really don't think much about the future life or the future, you know, future life, because everything has to do with this life. So then we are busy like crazy, you know, just to fulfill the needs of this life, because this life is so important, you know, to us. Yeah. And of course, of uh, dharma and worldly activities, you know, dharma is our side thing. Okay, by the way, side of the, it's just like, okay, if it works, it's all right. I'm going to do something here on the side. But really, I'm more involved in concerns. All of us, I'm not really talking about any, you or somebody in particular. All of us, you know, that's how we find ourselves doing. Uh, so when we really think seriously, you know, what Buddha has said, what the great Indian realized masters have said, Buddhist, what the realized Tibetan Buddhist masters have said, you know, we are in many ways just doing the opposite of what they said should not do or we should do. But we choose the, you know, the, the how should I say, uh, the other options rather than the, uh, the, what they recommended, you know, to us. So I think we all really need to I mean, think and uh, think through all these matters. Hmm. And, uh, you know, one of, uh, if you will, if not the most important, uh, you know, kind of advice that Shakyamuni Buddha 
has given us is like coming from the depth of his heart because he cares so much for us. As he said, Dipachi Amijachi, never do anything that is negative or unwholesome. Accumulate the wealth of virtue or wholesome actions. But how are we doing? You see, we have this map in front of us. So now we check, with, are we doing that or are we doing just the opposite? So if we can kind of uh, put a, you know, quantify just in a sort of sense how we are doing, that uh, the negativities that we get involved in or that we do are just into hundreds and thousands. But the positive things are just like very few, like 10, maybe a dozen, you know, and so if, you know, we put a number of those things, that's how our situation is. Mm-hmm. So as, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, practitioners of Dharma, it's very important for us to look within ourselves and find out, are we following or doing, you know, what Buddha really uh, teaches us to do? Oh, yeah. And additionally, if we want to be practitioners of a greater vehicle Buddhism or Bodhisattva's way of life, then of, of self and others' uh, interests, we have to pay more attention to others' interests. We have to consider others more important than the self. Bodhisattvas who are completely dedicated uh, to the well-being of all sentient beings, um, they consider others as much more important than themselves, and uh, their sense of dedication and commitment is that if for the sake of one particular sentient being, I need to remain in the worst kind of hell, okay, the burning hell or whatever hell, you know, for eons and eons, let it be, you know, I'm not going to you know, diminish my compassion, but I'm going to boost up my compassion and stay in a hell if need be, just to help one sentient being. So you can see how bodhisattvas are, you know, they are, you know, their thinking is very vast, you know, and they have that really deep sense of commitment and determination. But in our case, you know, I'm forget about you know, thinking about going to the hell for the sake of somebody. Uh, but even when we have to go through little difficulties to help others, you know, how much patience we have. Our patience is quite thin, you know. Uh, and um, so that's that, that's our situation. Now the third great compassion is the great compassion characterized by emptiness or selflessness. So how do we cultivate this kind of compassion, great compassion, which is characterized by emptiness? So when we look at ourselves and all other sentient beings, uh, the big reason behind our going round and round in samsara is because we have not yet realized emptiness. Because emptiness is the ultimate reality of the, 
nature of phenomena, the way in which everything really exists. You know, we haven't found it yet. We haven't realized it yet. We are caught up with um, uh, um, different uh, say, perceptions. So because of the you know, lack of understanding emptiness, we sentient beings uh, create contaminated karmic actions, and those karmic actions, you know, keep us in samsara or bring bring us back into samsara. Whenever we realize emptiness non-conceptually or directly, from then onward we will not create new karmas to be reborn in samsara or sickly existence. So how is that possible if you're wondering? Remember we said that the root cause of our being in samsara is grasping at, you know, uh, I or the self. Okay? And the way we perceive our the self to exist is as if it exists in and of itself, inherently. But that's not how the I or the self or any phenomena exists. And so when we realize emptiness directly, non-conceptually, so now we see the disparity between our grasping as self or I and the way in which I or the self actually exists. And it's like we see the true color here, right? So the real situation. And so because of that, we will not let ourselves, you know, to be influenced by, uh, uh, by the grasping itself or other delusions. No, no. So in a sutra it is stated, and Geshe quoted the statements from his memory, so it basically says, because of not understanding emptiness, uh, peace, and uh, what is called uh, non-production, I know I'm throwing all those uh, uh, technical terms at you, uh, so sentient beings, we as sentient beings create karmic actions which bring us back into samsara, and that's how we you know, we are wandering in uh, samsara. Uh. Great uh, Nagarjuna has stated, again Geshe-la quoted the lines from his memory in his work, that uh, we sentient beings are caught up in samsara or sickle existence and everything in samsara because uh, we are caught up in the fabrications, you know, of uh, grasping at self. Because our grasping at self fabricates everything, the way we perceive things and, you know, and we are so much caught up in that network of fabrications, and that's why we are stuck in samsara. Now, once we realize the true nature of self, then the fabrications will diminish, and that's how we liberate ourselves from uh, samsara. So, uh, basically, all these different uh, uh, quotes I have quoted from this, uh, uh, the message is the same, that we should understand that the reason why we ourselves are in samsara is because of our grasping at self, and we have not yet realized the true nature of self, not realized the emptiness of phenomena, or uh, self and things. And this is the same with all other sentient beings, you know. And uh, so based upon that kind of understanding, then we generate great compassion uh, to and for uh, our sentient beings.
And then we also develop uh, this uh, kind of enthusiastic uh, um, enthusiasm within our mind that I'm going to make best of my efforts to, uh, you know, uh, to realize emptiness. Yes. Now, when it comes to emptiness, understanding, we just cannot simply make good prayers as if that will do the you know, magic. No. I mean, we can just keep on praying and, you know, that's not going to, uh, you know, cut it. Uh, because to understand emptiness, we have to depend upon rationales or reasonings behind it. So it involves a lot of uh, understanding valid reasonings and analysis. Yes. And it is said that uh, we need to understand uh, the concept of uh, dependent arising or, you know, dependent origination, Prathit Samudpath or Tendo in Tibetan, and how everything exists dependently. So now we have to understand what does dependent existence means, what does dependent arising means. In some cases, the dependent arising means that things are produced by the causes and conditions. So the outcomes or the results are dependent on the causes and conditions. Otherwise, they won't happen. Okay? That's one understanding. But in another sense, sometimes it is the relativity, how things are connected and related to one another. If this doesn't exist, that won't exist. Okay? Because things are interconnected and related in many different ways. So we've got to understand uh, uh, that kind of uh, dependent uh, nature of uh, phenomena. So that will help us to understand what emptiness is. Uh, or Manjushri Lama Zongaba has uh, really praised uh, those uh, who have uh, realized uh, the concept of uh, dependent arising. Why? Because once we really understand what dependent arising means, what it is, then we are able to understand what emptiness is. Because that is the best reason or rationale of the, uh, the approach uh, to understand uh, emptiness. So when you meditate on emptiness, you know, in your mind, if you just kind of, uh, you make your mind kind of a blank, like, okay, nothing exists at all, while well, you have fallen into the extreme of nihilism, you know, because you cannot deny the existence of phenomena. So don't you know, put yourself in a state of mind where you think you're meditating on emptiness, but basically you have denied the existence of phenomena. But then, in the, you know, uh, in, if you put yourself in a state of mind, you say that, okay, things exist, but they really exist in and of themselves, you know, independently, objectively, inherently. Well, in this case, we have fallen into the extreme of uh, eternalism, you see. So those are the two extremes we need to avoid. Okay. So I would like you to um, I mean, think uh, more about, uh, you know, how, uh, what does it mean that things are dependently arisen? What does dependent arising mean? Tendo, okay, things. Or what does it mean that things exist relatively, you know, relativity, how things are related to one another? Or what does it mean that things are interconnected? You know, the, 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 uh, for example, the Tibetans, you know, we use the word like tento or tenjung, dependent origination, terba, relativity, you know, in, because we oppose the existence of phenomena in relation to something else. 
Okay? They may not have a cause and effect relationship, but in relation to something else, you've got to posit its existence. So that kind of relativity. So sometimes things are what we call interconnected. We call it teva, you see, meeting or contact, literally. Okay? So these are really important concepts to understand uh, what, what it, uh, I mean, um, important things to understand in order to understand uh, uh, dependent rising. Great Indian Master uh, Acharya Chandakirti, um, in his very salutation, which is the opening of his uh, supplement to the middle way of Madhimika Avatar, you know, where he, um, you know, uh, how should I say, salutes uh, great compassion and all of that, within that salutation itself, there is a profound message and teachings for us. Yes. So as you know, uh, I'm living uh, for India uh, uh, today, so this is your homework. So you want to think about these different concepts. Of course, so I mean, the, that, that is too simple an assignment to give you, right? There's more to that. You know, some days, you know, you will come and attend the teachings uh, by Venerable Tenzin Kaju, or Ani Kajula here, okay? Uh, she's a, she's a, she's a, she's a, she's a, uh, in the Buddhist literatures, we talk about uh, different uh, types of what we call reliances, you know, relying upon this, not relying upon that. So one of the uh, four reliances is that we should not rely upon a person, but rely on uh, uh, what he or she teaches, or the words. Okay? And uh, so the person may not, you know, uh, you know look good or whatever, uh, but what he or she says is something beneficial to us, you know, meaningful and helpful, then we got to listen to the words. So, that in this any chain is the young. And the young if you give it to the social and the non ladies and some pump. And it's not so used any turns of cage to use any cage of a show. So, Sunday, you know, you can come here to it, uh, the teachings of Venerable Things in Kaja, and then in other days you have more time to think about the assignment I just gave you, think about those, uh, you know, concepts. Uh, and related uh, issues, and then when I come back uh, from India, then I'm going to uh, ask you questions, and then I expect some answers. And of course, you know, some might uh, have a very smart mouth and give the right answers, but that's not so I'm just uh, exactly looking for, but something you really have thought about, you know, you truly contemplated, and, you know, with feeling and, you know, that contemplation, I want to hear the, you know, answers, not just uh, intellectual responses. Oh, so as a part of our daily practice, uh, as I uh, often talk about these things, that we seek the blessings and inspirations of the gurus and the holy beings uh, so that we are able to direct our mind into dharma, spirituality. And when we cultivate spirituality, may we become successful in cultivating spiritual path within our own mind system. And maybe we not face any obstacles on our spiritual journey and uh, be able to uh, fulfill our spiritual goals. Tangaranzo, that two teenage people give it all at any, and Sanji Temper and Bujata, you know, never done. Joey, you know, between the things she would tumble and she put a cap at Temper, the two genes of the baby, and do you want that? And two don't give you to each other, and you can't use our name, and you send them And you get to come that I yend, you take me good water that I yend, teaching the sort of the baby, and do you want that? Let us dedicate our collective uh, merit 
for the flourishing of uh, Dharma, the source of uh, benefits and happiness throughout the universe. May His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all other great holy beings, wherever they are in any part of the world and the universe, live long and be successful in fulfilling their visions, benefiting sentient beings. May spiritual communities throughout the world and spiritual practitioners from all traditions remain healthy, harmonious, and be successful in fulfilling their spiritual aspirations. May these and other world environments be free of all kinds of pains and problems, and may beings find peace, happiness, prosperity, and spirituality. <laughs> In short, we dedicate our collective uh, merit, positive energy, for all kind mother sentient beings to be free from the fears and dangers of two types of mental obscuration, and may we all reach complete enlightened state quickly. <laughs> So you can save your prostrations for Gishala's safe return from India. So Gishala said, you know, because he's kind of has to get ready to go to the airport, so you can, when he calls his return, you can come to see him, okay? Yeah. 